You're listening to the Reinvest Podcast, where each Tuesday we will show you how to reclaim, reconnect, and refocus your life by bringing you the top real estate professionals in the industry. We'll pull back the curtain so you can implement these tools and tactics to build generational wealth. Your host, Garrett Gatton and Seth Simonillo. Hey guys, thank you for jumping on to another episode of the Reinvest Podcast, episode number 78. Today, I'm excited to get into our topic. We're going to talk about uh, something that's been a buzzword in the investment community and in business uh, entrepreneurship for the last probably five years. Um, admittedly, I think I've been late to the party here, and I just started I so hearing too. about this. You think I saw, I've been late to the party? Yeah, I think, think you've been, been late to the party. <laughs> I was doing some research on virtual assistants, so that's what we're going to talk about today is virtual assistants. And I found a YouTube video of a guy like pulling back the curtain probably with his iPhone, like revealing how he uses virtual assistants. And I looked at the date and it was like 13 years ago. I was like, what the? Oh, wow. <laughs> so wow. Uh, I was Dude. I was surprised how long ago the video was from um, because it's very much, I mean, it's probably still the same type of stuff, same system, same kind of process that you would use with a virtual assistant if today. If you see a video on YouTube 13 years ago, that's old. I know, <laughs> I know, I was surprised. <laughs> so we're definitely behind the curve, but here we are to talk about it today. With Alex Tam, Alex, how you doing? I'm doing great, guys. How are you guys? Doing well, doing well. It's finally warm, so that's been nice. We've been outside here in Ohio. Yeah. Um, it's been 50s and 60s, so getting out of the the bitter cold of winter. And you said you're in Lake Tahoe, right? Yeah. So yeah. you understand cold, right? You kind of oh, get the. <laughs> it's, it's it's you know it gets into like the teens out here in the lows, mm -hmm. but in the teens and twenties and thirties, it doesn't get rarely get into the single digits. Oh, okay. So it's pretty stable. So yeah, we'll, we'll have maybe some more extreme fluctuations. It's funny in Ohio coming through winter, when you hit 50 degrees, your body has like been hibernating and has acclimated to severe <laughs> cold temperatures and you're just outside in like shorts and a t-shirt. Like this is great summer weather, you know, cause <laughs> yeah. that's just how it goes. But, but no, we're excited. Uh, and, and Alex, you know, give us a little context. It's not just real estate. It's not just virtual assistants. You kind of, you have a, a medical background as well. So I want to turn things over to you. Give us kind of some context how you got started, professional career, and how did that lead into real estate? Yeah, that's a great question. I started off as a chiropractor because my mom was helped by a chiropractor. And in 2005, I decided to enroll in chiropractic school. <clears throat> Came out of chiropractic school in 2008, opened our office in 2009. So this year will be our 15th year nice. in practice. Wow. And from 2009 to 2016, a lot of the marketing was just very standard. We'll go to farmer's markets, we'll do like a ad in the paper, magazine here and there. Digital marketing hasn't really picked up, or maybe I was a little late to the game. <laughs> I didn't feel like, you know, when MySpace came out, I needed to be that active. But then when Facebook came out, people were like, dude, you got to use Facebook and start using it. I've been trying to not do it for a while, only because I said, gosh, social media is such a time-consuming thing. Yeah, right. But everyone's on it. So I said, okay, I need to figure out this Facebook thing. So I started editing my videos. I started recording videos initially on a phone, one of these old cameras, right? <laughs> and it was like a Galaxy 2. I think it was a Galaxy 2 that I started <laughs> recording my videos on. And I started editing graphics. I would use learn how to use Photoshop, Power Director, you know, Fantasia, type, type of Adobe Premiere stuff. But here's what I found. Every Saturday and Sunday, I would go into the office for about four to five hours just to edit videos mm. and figure out the graphics. Yeah. It's a labor well, of love. Right. And my daughter was four at the time. And my wife is like, oh, my God, we already don't see you Monday through Friday. <laughs> what the hell is going on? Why are we losing you on Saturday and Sunday mornings as well? That is an all too real conversation that I've had before. <laughs> right. Right. Brings back memories. Huh? <laughs> Yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. So, so I said, there's got to be a way. There's got to be another way. I looked into hiring a graphics designer. And 
as I was looking at where do I find people, a YouTube video came on about a virtual assistant. So what the hell is a virtual assistant? What is that? I've never heard that term before. Mm-hmm. In 2016, it wasn't popular, right? And I started figuring out what it was. Okay, where do I find these people, right? So I hired my first one, and it was a game changer. Mm. We hired one for graphics and videos. It was part-time, then it went full-time real quick within two months. I realized, oh, my God, saving me so much time. I got back 40 hours. Then I wanted to do blogs. I hired another one for blogging. And then in 2017, I took in-house. I took my marketing for the business in-house because our marketers just wasn't getting it done. So Facebook marketing, Google marketing, I learned it first. I showed my VA how to do it, put her through the same course. And now they start running my marketing. Wow. So you brought your entire marketing for your chiropractic business Mm -hmm. in-house and then used virtual assistants as the legwork to do it in-house. Exactly. And then eventually other doctors wanted me to help them. I was like, okay, you know, we'll help you out here and there. I didn't have that much time to deal with their marketing. Right. Right. Uh, Because then I realized how marketers, how much, how little time they spend actually on your marketing. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> right. When you have your own team, completely game changer. And then in 2018, I went to the Grant Cardone 10X conference. Yeah. First time. Conference number two, right? And he talked about syndications. That's how I got into real estate. I was like, what the hell is a syndication? Wow. I never heard of that term before. Did he make this up? Right. At the time, I seriously thought he was the only one in the world who does it. I was like, wow, how innovative. <laughs> this Grant guy has got something figured out. Right. Yeah. So, um, okay, let's let's start investing in real estate that way. Got into multifamily as an LP. Then I found before our call or this call, we were talking about bigger pockets. Yeah. Right. I found bigger pockets in 2018 again. What a rabbit hole bigger pockets is. Right. I start reading and reading. I'm like reading stuff back to like 2011, right? Yeah. (laughs) And then found other syndicators who were great. So I started investing as an LP, right? At first. And so by then I had maybe three or four VAs. And then in 2021, what happened between 2018 and 2021? I was only investing as a limited partner, right? So you're just mailing checks and hoping you get some back. Right. Right. And- in 2021, I had so many doctors that I go to conferences with that asked me, hey, Alex, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? How's this working? How does this work? I did not feel educated enough to guide them. Mm, yeah. I said, if, if I'm going to guide doctors, and because I started developing some you know, passive income in four right, years right. in now. And I started telling them, I said, if I'm going to guide them, I need to know what the heck I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. right. So then I joined education. I went into Jake and Gino. Oh, yeah. And joined their program in 2021. Joined the MIH Mastermind in 2022. Met really high-level real estate-focused folks. And then got into KP, GP, JV positions and started doing all of that. And got all the other friends who are doctors into our deals. And in doing that, People in real estate, I realize, are some of the most innovative, creative people. Yeah, Yeah. right. And they started asking me, Alex, you still work? I got that one question. What do you mean do I still work? Well, you're always online. You're always on social media. You're posting reels and stories in the middle of the day. And I was like, yeah. I said, well, I got a team of VAs. And they're like, well, how do we get those? (laughs) So between me and another partner, we said enough people are asking us about VAs. Why don't we start an agency? Mm -hmm. Because at the beginning, I was showing people. I said, here's how you find them. Here's they're like, oh, my God, it's such a headache. Right. We we found a spot where people need it. And now years in, I'm like, what, ninth year in working with VAs, we have – 12 full-time VAs that work for me, mm. the office, and the different companies. And then we have source over 45 to 50 VAs wow. to other businesses wow. um, oh that work for them full-time. So wow. 
That's how that's how it became. Yeah, where it is. That's, that's wild. I mean, the whole time you're it sounds like uh, people noticed your success in what you were doing and they were like, help me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it kind of mm-hmm. made you grow in those different areas of, of the marketing and in real estate and eventually into the VA agency that um, it's really kind of pushed you to develop these these companies. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And I, I see it as a it's a full cycle thing. We have VAs that help people grow their business. As their business grow, well, eventually they're going to come back to me, hopefully, and ask me for, hey, you got any deals? What do I do with We got all some this extra money? cash. <laughs> Boom. We got some real yeah. estate for you as well. Yeah. So what yeah. I love about that is, and this is, I feel like this has been a word that I've just tried to create in my life is alignment, right? Mm. And so how you are, as an entrepreneur, you're already going to, be putting out a lot of energy, a lot of dedication, blood, sweat, tears. It's kind of the, it comes by the nature of being entrepreneurial, a business owner. The energy is going to be there. The question is, how do you get the most out of the energy that you're going to put out? Mm -hmm. And you kind of hit the glass ceiling, right? You only have so many hours in a day. Alex is only one man. You can only edit so many videos and then be, you know, doing adjustments and be in the office and do the back end of the business so how do you replicate yourself, right? And so you hit that glass ceiling. And uh, actually, oddly enough, another chiropractor friend of ours uh, posted on Instagram a few years ago. I've referenced this a couple of times. Create, or constraints breed creativity. Mm-hmm. And that phrase has always stuck with me, right? So you felt constrained because you wanted to spend time with your family uh, mm-hmm. or just avoid that awkward conversation with your wife. And <laughs> you had to creatively find a solution of uh, how do I do that, but still have a profitable business that's going to move forward. And so right. that was just very organic. So, so now um, let's, this is just a good segue, okay, into using virtual assistants to scale business. Kind of give us a proper definition, a proper working definition of what is a virtual assistant for somebody who might be listening to this episode and being like, oh, I've heard that term, but I still don't know what that is. Right. A virtual assistant is someone who is not physically working in the same location that you're working in that can help you either operate a business, work on marketing, work on sales, customer service, right? That is working with you to handle the tasks of a business. Now, a virtual assistant, can they be anywhere in the world? Yeah. Someone next door could be a virtual assistant. But with how fast our internet is and how great communication platforms we have, we can be anywhere in the world and work with a virtual assistant anywhere in the world. And it's almost as if they're just next door. Right. Right. Immediate feedback. So that's what a virtual assistant is. And people ask me all the time, what can a virtual assistant do? I said, everything that you can do on your phone or your computer a virtual assistant can do. I can do a lot of stuff on my phone and computer. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Everything. Everything. The question is, how much are you willing to let go and delegate your business and your life? Yeah. And the book, Who Not How, completely changed the game for me. I remember scaling from five or six and then working our way up to 12 within two to three years, the last two to three years. So, so yeah, break that down. Use yourself as a case study. So yeah, you got time back, but what, what, what else did you see? Cause there's a lag, right? Whenever you make a shift in business, you know, a new marketing push or you implement something, a new product or service, or you change yes. your processes, it takes time to get that feedback to how is that actually benefiting or changing my business? So use yourself as a case study. What happened aside from just getting your time back as you hired those VAs? Great question. Because what you mentioned as the lagging, these are the lagging indicators, right? Mm -hmm. One thing follows another. So for example, when we hired the first two years, when we got marketing in-house, number one, Less stress on my end dealing with different marketers. Because the first problem I had was every time I needed a change, it takes them a few days to get back to me. 
as an entrepreneur, you need that right now. Yeah. Right. And when I brought it in-house, it was within minutes, it got changed already. And the graphics and videos were done in-house now. The moment I have an idea, I shoot a video, I press upload, and it's on the next day. Mm-hmm. I got just the first three people we had got at least 40 hours back and less stress from me. But what mm-hmm. helped our office do is because we're able to streamline everything in-house. And the goal is, like I just had my VA team meeting, all 12 people and myself, right before this call. We had a brand new idea. And then I said, okay, who's in charge of this? How about this person's in charge? We manifest an idea into reality, okay, without my necessary input because I've already got the vision. Right Now it's you guys as a team and run with it. And here's what it translated. We had from 2018 to 2019, a 30% growth in our business. Wow. 2019 to 2020, it grew by 50%. And in 2020 to 2021, okay, we grew by another 25% during the first couple of years of COVID. Wow. Right? So we've been pretty steady since then, dialing in our systems, but we've been working on real estate now that I'm able to work on. Hopping on podcasts. We started the streamline team business. So, income wise, not only in the core business it has grown, it has allowed me to start other businesses Mm -hmm. to grow as well. And anytime now, when we start a new business, we have the economy to scale because I have the in house team built in because I have all the roles. Yep. That's what was interesting just poking around on the streamline website is you. You know, you guys were very intentional to make it a point that this is for any business owner. Yes. This isn't just real estate. It's not just, you know, a doctor or practitioner's office. This is any industry that that really can use this model to scale and grow. Um, but let's talk about some of the challenges that people might, uh, you know, the barriers, the whether they're mental with the person who is, maybe uh, going to go find a VA, uh, or once you're actually in it, the challenges you have to navigate. So some of the big ones, right? Culture barrier, language barrier, um, and then the limiting beliefs of the entrepreneur that the quality is going to suffer or that it's going to be too discombobulated and it's not going to be very dependable. Um, Mm -hmm. There's going to be high turnover, so I'm just always going to be training a new VA. Talk to some of those points uh, that you guys had to navigate. And then what did you find? Were they valid objections or did you find out they were actually pretty easy to navigate? That's a great topic to bring up because that's one of the first things that people ask me is, well, I've tried it myself, right? By now, people have heard of VAs. Any savvy entrepreneur has heard of one, right? Mm -hmm. They might have. Most of the people that we talked to, I've even tried one but failed. So then I ask them, what happened? And it is time zone differences, right? Mm. The language barrier. Ah, I just, they, I didn't feel like they knew what they were doing, mm. right? You know, and, and the quality of work, like the high turnover. You just mentioned, you hit it on the nail, right? All the things that you said. But here's the thing. I said, okay. Let's combat it one by one. The language barrier, right? The VAs that we source are from South America and the Philippines, okay? Now, in the Philippines, English is learned as a second language from grade school. Right. Right? So we got to find places where people are speaking English to begin with. You know, if you went to like, you can't, what was that? I said, it makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Like you don't start sourcing VAs from, I don't know, uh, Zimbabwe. If they don't, if I didn't <laughs> yeah. know Zimbabwe had an English baseline. But here's the other thing is most people believe just because they hire a VA who has the skill sets, this is one of the biggest barriers that they should know how to do it. Well, I hired a VA for social media. 
They should know how to post and, and do all these things. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, let me get this straight. If you hired a receptionist in-house, just because they've been a receptionist before, yeah. don't you have a 30, 60, and 90-day training process for them yeah. so they can learn how to do receptionist work in your office? So the expectations are not necessarily realistic. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. interesting. See, it's the same thing. The VA has to know. See, we've been so we we've been learning the use of virtual assistants very transactionally. Oh, Fiverr, mm, yeah, I just go right. handle oh, I do a logo, build a website. Yes, we've been learning to use VAs transactionally where you hire them for a specific task, right? Right. Well, when you hire a staff, it's not transactional. It is transformational. They need to understand your mission, vision, core values. That's great they understand stuff. who you are. <clears throat> because if they don't, how, how are you going to expect someone thousands of miles potentially away to understand what you do if you don't spend the time? Yeah. See, that's where business owners screw up. Yes, yes. Let me interject here for just a second because you are you're hitting on the head from w- somehow we we know that all of those things are true. We understand the importance of workplace culture, and we understand the importance of communicating vision to the employees in your organization. And if employee if it's hard enough to do that when they're physically in your office, how much harder is it going to be to communicate vision for somebody who is thousands of miles away? It's doable, but it just means that if anything, it's going to require more intentionality to convey that. And at the end of the day, these people are team members, right? You would never look at one of your employees uh, and expect that relationship to last if you're treating it transactionally. So why do you think that uh, entrepreneurs somehow treat VAs differently, that mindset? Like, well, why are they exclusive? Here, we understand the importance of pouring in and investing to our team members. And then over here, we expect them to plug and play and know everything that we need them to do. I believe it's because the concept of VAs right out of the gate was very transactional. Oh, I need to make a business card. Okay, this oh, is what right. I need it's to do. It's more project-based. More project-based, right? So people never really understood, oh, I can incorporate? Let me Let me tell you. Our VAs, how incorporated they are. I right now will not be able to function the businesses that we have without VAs. Okay. Yeah. Wow. In our medical office, we got from the marketing side, they're building that out. Mm-hmm. I record the videos. Our editors are editing it. Right. I have one and a half full time editors. That's all they do is edit content. Mm-hmm. We have two other marketers that builds the funnels, the marketing, the website, the the language, give ideas. We have another one that handles just the company medical office, social media. She gives ideas. I have an executive assistant who helps me with booking appointments, booking podcasts, confirming everything. Yeah. Right. Ordering. I mean, she handles everything in my life, you know? So, so maybe making the distinction between what I'm going to call gig work right? It's the Ubers, the DoorDashes, the Fivers. It's all of this freelance work that we know is out there and that people are willing to give us. And then there's platforms where we can go find that. Yes. But we've almost taken that and overlaid it on the virtual assistant. And you're saying to really have success at it, you need to set that mindset aside and view these people as employees employees in your company, team members, and invest in them like that. So we have been in the process of the last few weeks researching VAs. And it was funny that we ended up finding your company after we had hired a VA. So we had hired a VA and committed to someone. We found your company. We were like, oh, wow, this is another company that does VAs. And um, so we've been in the process of onboarding our VA. And it's the biggest challenge to me has been taking the time to explain, taking the time to create an outline Uh, training videos and actually explaining what are all the responsibilities and roles that we're trying to hand over and actually Mm -hmm. writing all that down and recording it. And because it's time consuming 
And I think a lot of people just, it's all in their head and they don't know how to get it to paper. Right. And they don't know how to explain it well enough to where a VA could actually learn and have some resources to go back and say, okay, how do I do this again? And um, so I don't know, that's been one of the biggest challenges for us is, is the handing over of all the knowledge. So we're kind of a weekend of, of some live training. You know what I'm thinking on that though, is we're talking and we've had these conversations. Um, you should kind of have that already. I know. And we, as we a should. business mm-hmm. owner, you should already exactly. have processes in place. And so really it's, it's not that, oh man, I have to do this for the virtual assistant. It's you were going to have to do this if you wanted to grow Scale. your company anyway. Right. And exactly. you just happen, you know, this is the thing that's actually the catalyst for that to happen. Cause really this is the first employee that we've hired for our business period. Right. Right. So, so this is kind of uncharted territories for us as well. Um, so it's it's been a unique learning experience. So how do you, so you've hired some VAs and maybe even talk about when you hired your first couple of VAs. How did you keep them accountable? Well, you have to have regular check-ins. When you're the only one working with VAs, you have regular check-ins. We use project management like monday.com to know exactly Here's the daily task. Here's the weekly task. Here's the monthly task. At the end of every day, they send either me or my team leader, VA, their end of day report. It's a screenshot of everything that they accomplished that day, Mm. right? We have touch points. We have task lists. So I know exactly what's started yet, in progress, or has been done, right? And then we have meetings, we have meetings. I initially, when I first started, without b- before, when our team was maybe six or seven, we had a 15-minute touch point every single day. Mm. Now that we have leaders in place within our VAs, now I have two touch points every week with the whole team, Monday and Fridays, right? And then throughout the day, if other VAs need things, they will reach out to the team leaders. If it really needs me, team leaders will reach out to me. Wow. Right? So now we have a process on how to delegate and it doesn't always have to come through me, you know, but at the beginning, you guys are right. You got to create these processes. There's a reason why over 50% of entrepreneurs in America are solopreneurs, mm. yeah. right? They know how to do the great doers but they can't scale because they never wrote down the processes, the SOPs, the KPIs that are needed to scale this business into multiple locations into a bigger team. Yeah. They know the how, but not the who. Ooh. Another (laughs) plug for that book. I'm I'm in the process of reading that right now, and I'm not far enough to to really parlay, you know, kind of that, but it it is a radical shift in your mindset. Yes. Um, when you, when you make that transition. So, um, <clears throat> all right. So let's maybe just kind of, uh, land the plane on the VA side of things. Um, what is streamlines process or your guys' business model in connecting VAs to a business owner, business owner, real estate investor says, I want to know more. What does that process look like? The process is we get on discovery call and I have to find out exactly why you need this VA and what this VA needs to do. And a lot of times between me and the business owner, the first conversation, they might not even know, Alex, I just need help. I th- I feel like I need a VA. And then I have to get to know about their business more, almost like an initial consulting about where's your business at? What do you do? What are your pain points? Walk them through how to figure out what yeah. type of VA they need. We had one of the recent clients. He I've known him for two years, real estate investor, met him in one of the masterminds. He called me. He says, Alex, I need to schedule a VA discovery call. We got on a call. He says, I got a part-time VA right now, but this is what I want to do. This is my vision. What, What kind of VA do I need? And we talked it out. I said, okay, what does your VA do right now? What's her skill set? What are you looking to do? What kind of, what kind of podcast, what kind of editing, what are you trying to do? I, they have to download, I have to download their vision mm-hmm. and then in my mind, work out the process and the who's for them. And yeah. then I explain to them, here's how the who is the person you need. Because sometimes we get caught up and think that 
A VA can be a great customer service caller, a great video editor, a great person who blogs and can run ads at the same time. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where, where do you find this person in real life? Tell me, where does this person exist in real life? Yeah. You find me that person, I'll hire <laughs> right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Those things don't align. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So we walked through that process. Now we got it dialed in. I said, okay, based on your goals, this is the type of person that you need. They're like, okay, okay, all right, I need that person. Okay, we go and find that person. When we find that person, we have our own vetting process that's been dialed in over the years, right? Multiple interviews, vetting process to make sure that I introduce the right person to you. When I feel like they're the right person, after multiple interviews, they've met the metrics, I then inter introduce them to you. Now you get to interview them, right? Hey, Seth, based on what we talked about, this is so-and-so. This is Jan. Jan has been experiencing this. Go ahead, shoot Jan with some questions. You interview her, making sure that she's the right one for you. Mm. And then we support you through the whole process, we have videos that we've shot that we send to clients that show them what's the expectation in working with the VA? What are some of the pain points that you might hit? We'll kind of sprinkle these videos in and then we'll sprinkle videos in on our VA side and say, here are the pain points sometimes, breakthrough points working with the client. Here's the expectations. So now we're coaching through video to VAs and the clients Exactly in setting expectations, not only mm -hmm. from the get-go, but an ongoing process in supporting right. you. Wow. So how do these VAs eventually get handed off as like permanent employees to these clients? Or are you guys always kind of have a hand in the mix and or how's that handoff work? Do eventually do you guys back out? Oh, that's a great question. The only way we can make this model work as an agency is we make money on the spread between what we pay the VA and what you guys pay us, right? We pay our VAs well. They have benefits. They have bonuses and incentives and everything, you see? And that's where we, that's how our our, our business makes money. It's on that spread to give yeah. you guys ongoing support. Mm -hmm. So the VAs will stay employed through the agency and they right. might be working full-time or part-time for a client. Correct. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah, and they're when they're 20 hours or 40 hours, that's the specific time that you need the VA to work. That time is yours. When you hit the call button, that VA should pick up right away. They're on the clock. Yeah. Right? The worst thing I hear is, well, I, I work with the VA and I can never find them. Dude, that's the wrong VA. Expectations right. are yeah. not <laughs> set correctly from the yeah. get-go. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. That's yeah, that great. is good. That's interesting. So you guys, so the model is the agency will find the right VA. So you guys are good at finding, recruiting, vetting virtual assistants. You will then pair them based on their skill set with what the client needs. Mm -hmm. And then you guys will be kind of the ongoing management piece in a way of keep, you know, connecting the VA with the client, making sure they're operating how they're supposed to, making sure, you know, expectations are set on both sides. Yep. And then um, the client will pay the agency. The agency makes the VA whole, and, you know, you get that's how you guys make your money is on that spread. Um, what happens to that VA when the client says, hey, I, I can no longer pay for a VA, my business model changed, or business is down, and we can't afford it anymore, and we got to walk away? That's it. Then we just, there's no, there's no contract. You know, we expect a three month upfront that we want to work with you for. We say, Hey, for the first three months, let's give it at least three months. Cause a lot of people is the first time, right? Or they've had a bad experience before. After the first three months, we're month to month. Mm. We're just month to month. Yeah. We're super simple. Or if you feel like, you know what? My goals have changed. Instead of this VA, I need a separate VA. So can we put this VA to part-time when we hire another VA? Absolutely. We're flexible with that. That's why in our VA company, we have VAs that work specifically 
with you guys and our VAs to make sure you have that success. Yeah. Yeah, that that process yeah. is important to you guys. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, we're going to jump into our smaller pocket segment. So, Alex, go ahead and tell us about it could be a real estate deal that went wrong or it could be something within one of your businesses that went terribly wrong. What happened and what did you learn from it? I would say uh, in real estate, at the beginning, I've always known to trust and verify, right? But at the beginning of my real estate real estate endeavor, the first one of, not the first, maybe the second deal or third deal we did, we didn't vet the main operator correctly. Mm. Mm. I didn't know how to vet an operator. And this right. was a joint venture deal. We invested with other people <coughs> and the main operator ended up using money into other deals oh, no. and taking it for his personal use. Oh, wow. And then we had accountants and lawyers who are in this JV. They start diving into it. And a few months they were like, whoa, something doesn't look right. Property tax wasn't pay, paid. This wasn't done. And this operator was jumping from deal to deal. Right there, like I was like, damn, he's one man show acquiring a lot of deals within the same area. Wow. Then I found out we were on the third deal in the local area. We found out the first deal. We started connecting with those people. They said it was going south. And I was Whoa. like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what happened? And we didn't dig enough into this operator and vetted them enough and mainly trusted too much and not verified enough enough wow so, so now so just to be clear so, is different so he um he he with it being a jv structure was your liability greater in that partnership than if you were an lp in another deal absolutely yeah absolutely because so, everybody's name was on the on the yeah you know. so what what happened to that deal well that deal eventually we ended up fine figuring out what it was we started asking for all the financials and financials more and more. And the person says, oh, well, I got to wait it for my accountant. And blah, blah. Dude, don't you have access? We should have access to that. Yeah. And once we got access, we started digging up holes. And we said, nope, we're not playing this anymore. We eventually sold it and got all of our money back. Wow. Right? Thank God. Thank God for appreciation. Yeah. Because <laughs> it wasn't the operations. I promise well, you that. Yeah. Because if it was a different market and we didn't have all this, you know, oh, appreciation, man, we you guys could have lost your tail. Yeah. Wow. Crushed. But that was the first, you know, the second or third deal we did. And then we have been very due diligence with everything else after that. Um, because now we know how. Did anybody go that. after that guy? Did he get sued or arrested or or is he still out there shaking he, it up in the real estate world? <laughs> he's still out there. What? He's still out That's there. That's how it always happens. That's no. how he's still out happens. there. He he went he, he ended up joining another group. Oh my god. And then wow. one of my colleagues from that we know from Mastermind, he's like, "Hey, didn't you guys say this dude was bad news?" And I said, which dude? And he shot me the name. I was like, yeah, that dude is bad news. Tell your group to stay the away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what's sad about that? Here, the irony is that most of the time, the people who are in the receiving end of that kind of relationship usually are not going to take to the internet and trash somebody's name because usually you have like a, a standard that you carry yourself to. Right. Right. And the irony is that then that person who, you know, committed the fraud or whatever it was moves to your point to another network of unsuspecting victims to do it again. And, yes. uh, it is, it is really sad. So what were just a couple of takeaways on how to vet, a sponsor like what questions should you've asked or things that you should have verified we should have verified all their past deals look at their other business opportunities we found out there were a there was a on was it the, the the better business bureau we dug up another business attached to their name that oh, there wow. was a fraudulent transaction oh okay yeah. reported from that itself it should have been a red flag 
but yeah. we didn't dig deep enough. So we can't just dig into the people's current real estate endeavors. That's right. I mean, you need to know like, hey, they were doing this between this year and this year. What the heck did they do? Let's yeah. dig up that stuff and see why did they leave that? Was it because, oh, I just didn't feel like doing it anymore? Or did they do something illegal yeah. and got kicked out of that field? <laughs> yeah. That's a good that's a good lesson. Wow. And and man, that is like that's where real estate can be forgiving. <laughs> if you're in an yeah. uh, up market, right. if you're in an upward pressured market, that's where it's really forgiving, where it could have ended really bad. You guys could have lost um, a lot of money if yeah. it had been a down yeah. market. So. Yeah. Have we yeah. waited another year? Good, good Lord. Interest right. rates like tripled, right? Yeah. But you could have stuck your head in the sand and been like, well, I'm supposed to be a passive investor in this. I don't have time to think about it. You took ownership of it. And that ownership led then to, you know, being able to pivot at the right time. Yeah. So, wow. Well, that's a good story. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, not to bring up the pain on that one again, but uh, people need to know so that hopefully they can avoid maybe a similar mistake. So yeah. we're going to go into what we call our little nugget. So Alex, this is part of our show where you give our listeners one practical takeaway or a piece of advice that they can implement to their businesses. You always... If, if I thought bigger about where my business goals would be from the get-go, I would have achieved and got to where I got to sooner. So the only, but then maybe I wasn't ready. But here's the thing. For people who are listening to this and who feel like, my gosh, have I been thinking too small? Right? Should I have thought bigger? Always, 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 always think bigger. Sit down and have time just to envision what that life is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Right? And see if that's the life you want. Mm -hmm. See, we, we're always told to dream huge and huge, right? A lot of, a lot of on social media nowadays, oh, private jets and this and that. Think about what that life looks like and see if that's the life you want and then set your priorities based on that. What are you willing to give up to have that life though? Right. Think about that. Yeah. Do you give up time? Are you willing to give up family? Right? My focus when I didn't, when I couldn't afford it, my focus and my goal boards were all Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Rolexes and all that. And then I got to the point where I can purchase that. And now it's like completely different. It's all more about making an impact, having epic experiences in my life, right? And goals change, but look at the bigger goal. And if that's what you want, work backwards, but don't always think about how you're going to do it. Think about who you're going to bring in. Because so it good. always yeah. takes a team. So good. I, read the book, guys. Who, not how. Read it. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> uh, that's good, man. That's good. I think asking that question, is that really what I want? Right? Because just because you see someone else's dream and lifestyle. Yes. I feel like sometimes you're like, well, I want that. Well, why? And it's like, well, because that's what success is. Well, what right. do you want? You know? Right. Uh, and, and success looks different. Right. Yeah. Right. So many people think that, oh, fancy cars, fancy clothes is a success. But that's what that person thought was successful. And then you get to achieve it and you're like, oh, shit, I really wanted time with family, friends family. Yeah. and relationships. Yeah. Yep. One of the uh, one of the thoughts that kind of helps me in the big picture of life, not just business, is I always try and pay attention to what people say on their deathbed. You know, and, yes. and I've been in some contexts, whether it's been ministry background or just, you know, family tragedy where you maybe are in that scenario where someone is coming to the end of their life. And it's so crucial to pay attention to the things that they're saying because there's absolute clarity in that moment. They're looking back on their life and making some kind of reflection and saying, man, where did I get it right? Where did I get it wrong? Yeah. Now, being 30 years old, I actually have some I can actually do something with that information. 
yes. versus being, you know, 85 years old. And, and, uh, so I love that kind of stuff, that perspective and clarity. I don't think you can go wrong there. Um, what's been one of the best resources in your business development? Seriously, it's going to be coaching, you know, wherever people are in life, in business, I believe you always have to be part of a group, a coaching group or a mastermind group, right? I initially have, I've always had and still have in my medical practice, part of a coaching program where I've got coaches or I've mentored others, right? And in the real estate, talked about Jake and Gino, the MIH mastermind, mm -hmm. right? Now in life, I've recently in the last few months joined GoBundance, mm -hmm. you know, and work yeah. with other entrepreneurs who are living epic lives, right? So we, we should always have some form of mentorship, a group that we look to for guidance because as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, sometimes it does. If you're only doing what you're doing locally and not reaching out to others, it gets a little bit lonely. Yeah. A yeah. little bit. It's the, to your point, even on the VA, the whole premise of that is that, um, technology has opened up new pathways to make yes. relationships. And that's not just on finding employees for your business, but it's finding like-minded people that you Absolutely. otherwise wouldn't have a chance to rub shoulders with. So 100%. I think that's great. I've heard good things about go abundance. Um, how can people find out more about you, follow your success, get connected with some of the services that you guys provide? Well, watch this podcast. <laughs> right? Go on Facebook and hit me up. Yeah. You know, and LinkedIn connect with me. Right. You know, if you're a doctor, you're a business owner who needs a VA or you're interested in real estate, I'm I'm all ears and, and I like to connect with people who are don't connect with me if you're not trying to do better in life. Connect with me if you are looking to level up in your life. And want to connect with others who are trying to live more epic lives. Yeah. Right. I don't want to stay the same. I don't want to drag any, be dragged down by anybody. Yeah. Right. You know, so, hey, those are the people I want to connect with. Awesome. Well, we will, we'll put the the links to your websites and the show notes and also your social media accounts as well. Uh, guys, I hope you have benefited from this conversation. I know I have, Alex, uh, just pulling back the curtain on your experience and how that's led you to be able to help other people do some of the same stuff. So, uh, brother, thanks for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me, guys. As always, excited that you joined us on another episode of the Reinvest Podcast. If this episode added to your tool belt or left you feeling inspired, go ahead and share it with a friend. Stay tuned every Tuesday for new episodes. And if you want to get in touch with us, go to our LinkedIn or Facebook profiles and shoot us a message. Move farther, reach higher, and grow deeper. See you next time.